we look at the past, I would hope we can get inspired by looking at the craftsmanship and looking at the details and long to build better because we see beautiful things like this. Why are period revival homes of the 20s better than period revival homes today? Any guesses? <coughs> architect, someone said architect, lumber quality. You don't know about lumber quality. <laughs> Any other guesses? I don't have any. What's that? Proximity to the original. Proximity to the original. In time and distance. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. You know, I noticed that uh, new houses that are trying to do traditional are much better in New England than they are here. And I think that has to do with that proximity to the original that you're describing. Uh, certainly what we see, uh, we, we get better at because we're good copiers. So this house, European influenced, French inspired, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? It's a little over the top, um, right? But this is an example of a period revival French ch chateau looking thing that in my opinion is ugly. And so, you know, these big blank windows with no divided lights, these, that, that there's, there's no sense of scale here. Um, it's meant to show off, right? It's not, it doesn't have that, doesn't capture that scale and that beauty of, of the traditional houses. If you think about the design influences that were available in the 20s from, you know, magazines, we didn't even talk about magazines and their influence, but certainly the drawings, Habs, uh, Colonial Williamsburg, places people were looking there was a strong emphasis and study on, on getting things right. And today, um, we, there is a non-unified voice, whatever the word is, it, there's a non-unified voice. And there's so much information that comes from here, right? And here, that is bad, okay? Because people go, you know, people that aren't, uh, they're excited about architecture, but they don't know. And so they post things. They go, look at this French thing. It's not French, right? And they look at this English thing. And I can't tell you the number of manufacturers that will have molding catalogs saying this is a Georgian molding and it's nothing close to a Georgian molding. So there is a, uh, a level of uh, understanding and expertise that we've lost. And, and there's, I'm, I'm hinting at a little bit because I'm setting us up for the next talk, which is on the mid-century modern and post-World War II building, um, because a lot of these things are happening there. The architect, but someone said the architect, um, drifts away from residential design, okay? And so we, we end up with things like this, right? Where, you know, more carved moldings, the better, right? Just, just throw a bunch of carvings and people will think I spent a lot of money, right? And, <laughs> And it's, it's a mess, you know, and then modernism comes in and we, we look at the, the house that looks like the, you know, the Apple store and, or, you know, strip mall and you go, hmm, you know, what's right? You know, what, what is good modernism? What's, what's bad modernism? What, how do I know? We don't know. And so there is a, um, there are, there are very few, I would say, <laughs> let me go on the shelf here. We're going to let them here. I would say in Texas, there's probably 10 architects who are good. <laughs> How many architects are in here? 10 architects, they're right here. Um, when I say good, I mean good at residential period design, okay? There are great architects all over, okay? But to, to get this style right, um, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. One of my favorite architects in Pennsylvania is a guy named John Milner. He started out as a preservationist. He was actually going into old buildings, measuring the buildings, figuring out how the rafter tail worked, figuring out how the sash worked. And he is an excellent uh, designer of period houses today because he studied the old stuff really, really hard for a long time. So it takes that expertise and you can't go on Pinterest and educate yourself. You guys are not coming next week, right? <laughs> <laughs> Most of the revival houses architecturally designed or were they mostly 
mostly just copies? That's a good question. Uh, what percentage of uh, houses today are designed by an architect? What do you guys think? 20%. 2 to 3%. 2 to 3%. Now, you got to qualify that, okay, because a production builder might have an architect on staff, and they say, well, all those houses are designed by an architect. I wouldn't say that those are houses are designed by an architect, okay? So very few, even traditionally, were designed by an architect, okay? The problem is, part of the problem today, and I'm kind of tipping my hand to the next time we talk about this, is modernism comes in and the schools are stop teaching traditional design. In classical design, they teach modern design. And so architects get out of school and they don't know how to do that because they didn't study that, right? The good traditional architects that I know describe getting out of architecture school and going back and studying those buildings themselves to become proficient like they are today. So good point, they're, they're most houses aren't designed by an architect. And it's the reason why I can say there's probably only 10 in Texas who are any good, because most <laughs> aren't trained and done. So we have a strong need for talented designers today. It doesn't have to be an architect. It just we, we need talented people who, who care about these things. Um, we need to be better students of the past. As I look at these books and all the work that went into studying and documenting the past of those things, I see, in my mind, it's clear they're better in the past than they are today because we spent more time studying them. We spent more time looking at them. We spent more time measuring them. And so we need to be better students. Um, then the strong need for the, the art of building, the lost art of building. To execute this, okay, takes skill, okay? You can't just hand that to a guy and expect him to execute that well. Not only, uh, you know, if it's a timber, but, but pegging it, and, and putting this together, turning these things so that scale and proportion are right, building that door, it takes hard work. It's, it's, it's not easy. And so I, I, I said this quote again, okay, builders think that because their houses are selling, they're well designed. Homeowners think that because it was built, someone must have designed it, okay? And that's not true in either side, right? And so it, th there's a lot of houses being built today that are assembled okay that are not designed okay and then this is the the tip to the the next next talk what happened to architects and i just and I, I explained that a little bit but in the 1920s okay the architects designed in the same styles right the the montgomery ward building there was five montgomery Ward buildings around this around the country done in that mission revival style right and so they were designing houses in that style. They're designing commercial buildings in that style. And if you d drive around these historic neighborhoods, I mean, Highland Park Village, right? There's a period revival, uh, mission revival style. Um, there's numerous examples all over Fort Worth of you know pre-1940 things that were done in the same style. So there is a language and 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 happening that is lost today. Um, and then. As we look, go forward, right? This is what William Levitt was building in 1950. This was being celebrated in 1950, right? So the split that takes place between, you know, residential and commercial, res uh, architects and, and, you know, house design things and what William Levitt does, it's astounding um, and awesome what we're gonna see as far as how that happens. 